Okay, welcome everybody. It is great to see you here at our last module of this year's secondary transition and SLP series, which is a uh, post secondary education career and the world at large and looking at how communication impacts all of that. Today is our zoom meeting zoom meeting follow up to the course that opened last Monday. So hopefully you've been able to access that Schoology course. And we will be looking at some of those highlights uh, that were presented in that online course and also building on it and giving you guys a chance to network with each other over the next hour. This is a presentation by the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network or PADEN. Our goal here at Padden is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local educational agencies, that's all of you, to serve students who receive special education services. And we know that speech language is a huge part of that. We have about 14% of our students who qualify for special education in the state of PA, about 14% qualifying for speech only and then beyond that we have so many more students that have another primary diagnosis who qualify for speech so what all of you do is so important every day and we are so happy to have these opportunities to let you get together and network on some of these ideas that have been presented we at Patton share PD's commitment to the least restrictive environment. Our goal for each child is to ensure that IEP teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services first before considering a more restrictive environment. And we are also committed to family engagement. Family engagement promotes equitable partnerships among schools, families, and communities to actively advance student achievement through shared commitment, decision-making, and responsibility. And I often think that communication is one of the places where we see the most overlap uh, between the academic world and the world at home because it's so important for each of those areas, so many different environments. All right, so because you get ASHA credit for this presentation, I have to give you my bio. I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, but it is here and it is on your Schoology site if you'd like to read it. Um, I have no disclosures to make really, except that I'm an employee of Patton and receive no additional monetary compensation for this presentation. I also have my C's, my PA state license in speech language pathology, and I am the parent of a child with a speech language disability. And I will get to my uh, little family bio in a moment here, but just to give you a reminder, in order to receive ASHA credit for this presentation, you need to complete the necessary activities in the Schoology course. So that's watching the video and completing the Google form. Hopefully that's done already. You do need to remain logged on for the entire Zoom session and log out at the end. You have to participate in any activities we do, chats, breakout rooms, et cetera, and um, complete the ASHA survey, which is on your Schoology account as well. We will also provide you a link for that and the correct end of session code. And do be sure when you're doing that, that you are using the name that's associated with your ASHA account, because sometimes we have trouble when people have changed their names, maybe um, you got married or something like that. If the names don't match up, that can be problematic for us. So make sure that you use that same name and same email number that are always associated with your ASHA account. Makes all of our lives easier because we don't have to hunt you down. All right. So my very short bio um, that I'll do right now is my name is Jennifer Geibel. I'm an educational consultant with Pat in Pittsburgh out here in Western PA. I am an SLP. I'm also supervisor and director and doctor of special education. And I've worked in many different areas as a speech language pathologist, both in the medical model as well as the educational model. And in education, I worked with preschool all the way up through age 21. Um, and I have done tele-intervention for a long time as well, long before everybody was doing tele-intervention. I, I was on the bandwagon for that. I am also a mother of three great boys and my youngest one there in the photograph, he is my son that has a speech language disability. He has some um, 
articulation issues that he is still dealing with um, but has come a long long way and he has always made me appreciate everything that our families go through when they are experiencing those unique challenges of working with a child who has difficulty communicating. All right, so today we have two main objectives. We're going to, by the end, have researched three apps, really more than three, but uh, make sure you know three, <laughs> that can be used to support executive functioning skills, such as sequencing, memory, and organization. And we will talk about the connection that has with communication. And another objective, you're going to identify three communication goals or activities that may be appropriate for students described in case studies to increase effective workplace communication. So making those connections between job and what we're doing at the transition age level. All right, we're going to start out by taking a poll. So I will launch that. It's right on Zoom, so it should come up on your screen. It's only three questions. I'd like to know a little more about what's your region? Are you West, Central, or East? And if you're not totally sure, take a guess. It's OK. Um, I would like to know what your experience is in working with transition age students. I know some of you sign up for these courses just to learn because you are interested in learning more about the topic, but you may be working directly with transition age. So just mark whichever box is most applicable. And then where have you provided speech services for transition age students or to transition age students? And uh, pick the one that you would do the most. So the speech room, the classroom, the job site, extracurriculars, whatever that may be. All right, so I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to do that. We almost have everybody out of our 34 people. So we're pretty close. And just so you're aware, we do have a, a, a live captioner today. So if you need closed captioning, you can activate that on your end. Our captioner, Rebecca, is working with us. All right, it looks like everybody responded. Fantastic. I'm going to share the results with you. So it looks like Oh, so many people from the east. Uh, welcome <laughs> from the other side of the state. I'm from the west, but it looks like most of you guys are, are out on the eastern side of the state. So, so glad to have you here with us. Um, and as far as experience in working with transition age students, looks like some of you are providing speech language services, but quite a few of you are case manager as well. So that's a kind of a steep learning curve sometimes when you're a case manager because um, we don't always study this stuff in grad school, <laughs> secondary transition. So it's a lot to learn. And I appreciate you being here today. I'm sure you have a lot of insights that you can share in our breakout rooms later today. And we had one person that was other. So if you'd like to put in the chat what your role is, that would be interesting to us. And then we have the third question, where have you provided speech language uh, services for transition age students, speech room, classroom, et cetera. Looks like the majority are the speech room, but we have a, a couple different um, options here as well in the home, online, job site, classroom. And I love that at least one of you has been on the job site because that's a great place to work on some of those career related skills. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to stop that share for the moment. And we're going to go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so we have a couple of different sections to our presentation today. And the first one is let's get organized, speech language and executive functioning. So you might have a question, you might have the question, well, one, what is executive functioning? And two, why are we talking about it here? And so we are going to seek to answer both those questions in the first part of this presentation. Executive functioning is a collection of processes that are responsible for guiding, directing, and managing cognitive, emotional, and behavioral functions. So that is an actual definition. But what does that mean in the real world? What does that look like? Well, for all of us, we could have a lot of, of elements of executive functioning, but here are the top six. So the top six executive functions are self-regulation, sequencing of behavior, flexibility, 
response inhibition, planning, and organization, organization of behavior. So if you look at all of these and think how much you use all of these functions on a daily basis, uh, you can probably see how important executive functioning is in your own life. And you could probably also picture some students that you have that might have a bit of difficulty with this. I think we've all worked with kids who maybe were slightly disorganized. I know my own personal children at home, two of the three are almost completely disorganized. So, you know, definitely something that many people can work on. But what does executive functioning look like? Now, Today, we're going to look at executive functioning in the workplace because we are making those connections to post-secondary education and career. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how some of these executive functioning difficulties manifest themselves. Well, for students that have challenges with things like transitioning, organization, short-term memory, they have to deal with the reality that work itself is something that's unpredictable and that it can change from day to day. Even if we have an established routine at work, it's not always going to be the same. And so for a student that has any of those challenges, transitioning organization, adapting to that new task or change of focus might be very difficult for them. And in doing so, they're going to have reduced flexibility and adaptability that's going to make the workplace a challenging place. How about students that have difficulties with planning, prioritization, time management. Well, in the real world, employees, employers assume that their employees know how to get things done. They know how to plan things out and set steps up in order. So for individuals that have trouble with this, trouble figuring out things like task order, they can lose track of time, they can fail to complete tasks, they can miss deadlines. And it looks to their employers that they have reduced efficiency on the job, that they can't get through what they're supposed to get through. And how about challenges like attention and short-term memory organization? Well, in the real world, employees are expected to come to work and be on time and complete the job that they are supposed to complete. And when they have difficulties with things like being prepared or equipped for work, it ends up looking like they don't want to be there. It looks like, whether it is true or not, and probably not, it looks like a lack of diligence, a lack of attention to detail. And this can be really reprehensible for students with disabilities because they are going into the workplace with, with a lot of challenges, perhaps. and maybe they don't look like they are able to complete the task in the same way as others. And how about things like impulse control and self-monitoring? All right, so at work, even if you're really, really angry or upset or tired, you have to control your emotions. It's just part of being at work. Um, we have to get through the day. We have to be with other people <laughs> throughout that day. And, and not lash out at others, not become uncontrollably upset. You know, we have a certain amount of control in order to be successful. So for students that can't do this or that have a hard time with it, they seem like they're not being socially appropriate. And they might demonstrate that they have problems with certain things like accepting criticism. That could be difficult for them. And it really reduces their on-the-job diplomacy, that ability to get along with all the different players in the workplace. So these are all challenges that any of our students could have. Now, why do we care about executive functioning as speech-language pathologists? If we were, were to run down the, um, the difficulties that your students have, you might identify things like articulation, expressive language, receptive language, fluency, pragmatics, but maybe you wouldn't think of executive functioning as being on that list of challenges that we look at. Well, language and executive functioning are reciprocal. They build on top of each other. Many, many executive functioning skills are directly related to language. And I think we could find that even just by looking at that big six, as far as executive functions go, 
um, how much does sequencing relate to language? How much does planning? And that's just two of them, right? Um, research shows that there are correlations between difficulties with language and challenges with executive functioning. We can't find a causal relationship. Maybe it's like a chicken and an egg, which came first, we're not sure. Um, but there are, is certainly a correlation between individuals that have those hard times with language and also showing challenges with executive functioning. So if we're going to help our students, our students that see us for communication challenges, if we're going to help them provide them with strategies that will also assist in their executive functioning. There are several strategies that we can use. And these might be strategies planned out by us or more appropriately by the entire transition team, right? Uh, things that we can all help with. So some strategies for executive functioning are teaching students how to set goals and objectives or just setting those goals and objectives, you know, kind of giving them something to work towards or for breaking large tasks into more manageable ones. I kind of remember this back when I was in, what, junior high and we'd have to write a paper, maybe uh, high school even, write a big paper, but you break it into chunks, right? This is when you need to do your research. This is when you need to take your notes, et cetera. Um, things like creating checklists are great for students who have difficulties with executive functioning. Establishing routines is fabulous. Um, also, Practicing breaking routines, always something good to work on. Uh, utilizing visual schedules, employing graphic organizers, and then using self-regulation strategies, whether that's asking for a break or um, doing some deep breathing, whatever that looks like. So as our students move on into the outside world, it is of an advantage to us if we give them some tools that they can use when we're not there, because we will not be with them always, um, even though we would love to support them. So it might make you happy to know that whatever your executive functioning difficulty, there's an app for that. Um, there's in fact so, so many apps for all of these. And I've made quite a list of them here, but I'm going to point out several of them specifically. So thinking about those big executive functions that people might have difficulty with, uh, one of which has to do with things like calendars, timers. Um, so maybe that difficulty uh, paying attention to deadlines or time constraints. There are many, many apps for that. And some of you, I bet use them yourself. So I would like you to throw quickly into chat some sort of digital app, digital platform that you use to keep track of time or dates. So go ahead and throw that into the chat. I would like to see what ends up there. Okay, so we see already a lot of Google, Google Calendar, Google Tasks. Oh, tons of Google Calendar. iOS Calendar. Timer on Google, good. Teams Calendar. Anything else? <laughs> Alice writes that she still uses her appointment book. And Alice, we don't judge. You use that appointment book. <laughs> Go for it. It doesn't have to be digital. That's your strategy. Um, game changer app, upload sports schedule. Okay, I hear where you're coming from here because I've got three boys and they all play soccer. And I think right now they're on like five different teams. So I love anything that puts their sports calendars on my phone. Uh, definitely helps with my own executive functioning. Outlook, I use Outlook quite a lot. Okay, phone calendar. All right, so it looks like many of you use these type of apps. Let's see if there's anything new. Oh, reminder app, alarm. Okay, alarms is a good one to remember. I don't know the H-E-J-A, Heja app, post-it note app. Carly, if you wanna tell us more about that one, I'm not familiar with that one and I'd love to learn. So go ahead and stick that in the chat. But it does look like many, many of us, with the exception of Alice, who still uses appointment books. And again, no judgment, Alice, you go. Um, it looks like many of us use calendars and timers uh, for ourselves. And I'm sure we use them also to some extent for our students. 
Um, another thing we might use apps for are visual checklists. So whether it's keeping track of, of to-do lists, things you want to get through, um, things like OneNote, Evernote, um, that you can plan out your day, even things like Google Slides could be a checklist depending on how we're using it. Um, even PowerPoint could be a checklist depending on how you're using it. There's lots of options here. And then we also have visual schedules. So I put several down here. Remember the milk, 30, 30 choice works, first then schedule, first then visual schedule, which is really basic. And it's that idea of first we do this, then we do this, which a lot of our students need. Um, so we can also use digital means for visual scheduling. All right, I'm just looking into the chat. Oh, so the Haja app is a group back app that's used for sports schedules and kids school groups. Okay, very, very good. Um, and then I see Jessica, Alice, Jessica wants you to know you're not alone. She still uses an old school planner too. So thank you for sharing out, that is great. And Beth writes that she has a chalkboard in her house for organization. I have a uh, dry erase board, so, so very similar there. So you're right, guys, it doesn't always have to be an app, even though we have obviously many options out there, but, but these strategies are all really important. Okay, if, however, we do choose to use tech for purposes of executive functioning, when possible, we should use tech that's already familiar to the student. So if you have a student who has an iPhone, it might be a good idea to use some of the things built into your iPhone or into that student's iPhone to support them, whether that's something like an alarm or a timer, um, maybe it's some apps that you can put on their phone because this is what they're familiar with, that is really helpful. So one of the things you wanna do probably is talk to your student, get them on board with your planning because if they have a platform they like better, they prefer to use their phone versus using their laptop or their tablet for something, um, these are all really important for us to know so we can help plan. Once you've decided what tech to use with your students, what app, what platform, however it looks, you need to ensure that that stu student is fluent with the technology within that app. Now, executive functioning and communication, they're really, really closely related. It doesn't mean that this has to be all you, right? Probably all the members of the team are going to benefit from working with the student using this tech if that tech is supporting them through executive functioning. Also, we need to remember that we're including families in this too, because once our students leave school, we're not there to support them. We want them to be able to take what they learn about applying digital technology and move it forward into whatever their next volume of life is, whether that's post-secondary career, education, or just you know living on their own. Um, so make sure that the student is fluent with tech, and I would also extend that to uh, making sure that the classroom teachers, the parents are fluent with tech. Make sure you're using this tech in everyday functional situations, so you're showing how it helps students. If there's a visual schedule in the classroom, how can you utilize that every day to teach that idea of scheduling or checking the visual schedule or accessing it on your phone? Um, is there a way we could take everyday activities that the student is participating in and break them into more manageable tasks so they can kind of walk through, again, how to use their checklist app, for example. So make sure you're employing that in all sorts of different functional situations and also provide choices. So we don't want necessarily the the app we're using to be the be all and end all. If the student is able to find something that works better for them, or if they just decide one day, like, really, I tried using the phone for this, but I would rather write this down on paper than give them that option. You know, these things can always be changed and we want the student to own it. Ultimately, they're going to have to be responsible for whatever they choose. So I have a couple examples here of tech. So here is, um, an app called Memo Assist. I actually really like Memo Assist because it has a lot of built-in pictures you can use. Now, Memo Assist in its purest form is not free, but you can get a sample of it 
to use on a minimal basis if it's something that you wanted to try. What I like about it is you can put in, you can use the pictures they have, or you can put in your own pictures for various activities. Now, obviously, these are activities of daily living here, but you could do this with anything. So I have made memo assists before, um, for example, for a student whose job it is to clean the kitchen. And they were having trouble remembering the order of these steps. And so I made pictures, clean the Keurig, clean the counters, whatever it was in order. And I was able to take photos of the kitchen area itself and put them in this app, which was really helpful. That's one example. OneNote is another one. And OneNote is sort of uh, something that's very well known. It's been built in to Microsoft for a long, 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 long time. Um, you can do many, many things with OneNote, create checklists. Um, I, I, people do math on OneNote. You, you can take notes. It's, very, it's a very big system. In this case, we've created a checklist. So this is for a student who's looking to do some bicycle repair. Maybe they're doing this for um, uh, an internship they're at or something. So they, uh, they wanted to go through and make sure that they had all the pieces to to build this bike and they've put pictures of them and also a checklist here that they can utilize. And then here's another example. This is ChoiceWorks. ChoiceWorks also is able to make visual schedules. So this is an, ex is an example of a visual schedule that a student has created. Now this one is for school. It would look very different perhaps if it were the workplace. Um, it might look very complex if it's a student going to college who's created a, a schedule that might change every day, right? Based on what days they have classes. Do they have Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Um, do they have a seminar on Tuesday night? This could look very much more complex, but would still be usable by the student. All right, so we're going to take a moment and consider these executive functioning apps. So what I want you to do is think of one of the students on your caseload. It could be that target student that you've been thinking about all week um, for the Schoology activities. How would you utilize an executive functioning app to empower the student? Because this is all about building independence. So see if you can put a specific situation in the chat in which the student could be empowered using an executive functioning app. And as you guys go ahead and type that in the, to the chat, um, I will give an example of this. I had worked with a student who um, really had difficulty with just the concept of time, um, was not a student that necessarily remembered to, to do things that they were supposed to do in the right order. So I he did have a phone. And so I was able to get him to start putting things on his calendar, which I know seems like a small thing, but for him, it was really, really important um, because he didn't necessarily remember every day what he was supposed to do. So having them in the calendar with little alarms, like, oh, now it's time to do whatever, go to OT, go to class, whatever it looked like was really important. All right, so let's take a look at some, oh, I'm sorry, I moved the slides. I was looking in the chat, I apologize. So Ashley has a student that repeatedly forgets to check his email. Um, so he, that might be a good um, thing to address with an executive functioning app, maybe give him a little reminder. Um, okay, so we have already a student is using choice works to complete tasks. We see using photos to follow steps of a task schedule for getting ready for school in the morning. Um, Megan loves choice works. I do too. I think it's fantastic. Task reminder for important things to do every day, bath time routine. That would be that more independent living, but absolutely. Um, that's, we always have to remember independent living is one of those post-secondary transition domains. Using a Google calendar to track school assignments, use of OneNote as checklist for job tasks. All right, and there's so many more. I can't read them all. A phone reminders are coming up a lot. Alarm reminders on the calendar. Um, these are fantastic, though. Uh, during virtual learning, using reminder apps. Um, a student who cleans at the local fire hall um, would really benefit from a visual schedule. Oh, great. Thank you. Task reminder. A student working at Hershey Park. Um, 
maybe giving him some timing cues, visual recipes. Great one, morning routine. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't read them all because you guys are all so fabulous. They, there's so many, uh, there's so many options put here in the chat. Thank you so much. Photos, checklists, great. Um, so think about how you would utilize with students. And, and maybe this is something that's going to come up at your transition meetings. Because remember the students, when they don't have you, they can still rely on their tech and trust me, they're gonna have their phones on them at all times, I would imagine. All right, thank you so much. So we had our little discussion about um, executive functioning and how we have this integral relationship between communication and executive functioning. And we might wanna use some executive functioning apps to kind of transform what students do, whether it's a work or home or on the job site. And we're going to carry over this discussion of the job site. So we had a section in our presentation that was on our video called Working It Out. And that was making sense of those transition partnerships uh, between, between us and the work world. Because um, when we look at these three domains of secondary transition, we know that we have post-secondary education, independent living slash community participation, and then we also have career. And for as many of our students as possible, we'd like to see them move towards a life that has a career, uh, something to provide them with job satisfaction, something that is fulfilling and meaningful to them as individuals. And when we look at the workplace, we see that communication is extremely important. So when we have a workplace with good communication, we have all these pluses like increased efficacy, we have augmented productivity, increased creativity, greater levels of trust between employees, between employees and employer, um, improved employee engagement. You wanna be there, you wanna be active, um, increased abilities to successfully resolve conflict and better relationships between clients, customers, and the people at the place of business. So communication is really important in the workplace. So what I would like to do today is to start to make some connections between communication and the workplace. So we are actually going to do an activity here. Now I'll just preface it with a couple of instructions. Um, and I think I don't need to make as many breakout rooms as I thought. How many people do we have here? Um, okay, it's around 35. All right, what we're gonna do is this. I am going to assign you to a breakout room. And I want you to read the scenario that's in the breakout room. Now, some of these I was more detailed on than others, but each scenario describes a student who is currently in school, who is dealing with some speech language challenges, but who has a dream. They have a dream of something, of moving forward to something else as a career. So whether these students are looking to work in the health field or the restaurant field, it could be a lot of different things, but they will be planning to move forward and, and have a job. So I want you to read the scenario and look at the job, look at maybe their challenges that they're experiencing right now and collaborate with your colleagues. So determine three goals or activities that would connect communication and career. So I put some samples of these on the Google Slides that I'm going to share with you, but these could be things like things that help you just function in the workplace, maybe the ability to ask for accommodations that you might need in the workplace. They could directly relate to particular job scenarios that students could be experiencing. Um, so it's really up to you. And so again, goals or activities, so things that you want to approve or very specific activities you're going to do with these students. So I am going to grab the link and share that with you. And then I will form the breakout rooms. This is a Google slideshow. You should be able to edit. If you do not have ability to edit, please let me know because sometimes we all make mistakes on permissions and I'm sure that I could have done that. So go ahead and see if you can access that link that's in the chat and I'll give you a moment to do that. Okay, 
I'm not seeing that anybody can't do it, so I'm going to assume it's okay. All right. So I'm making 10 breakout rooms. You're going to be in a breakout room with only one or two other people. This will give you a good chance to chat. And we're going to take maybe 15 minutes or so and come up with three goals or activities that you can use that will directly connect the student's communication needs with their plans for career. All right, so I'm gonna open the rooms now. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. I did want to take a moment and review some of these because they looked really fabulous. And I know this wasn't a lot to go on as far as the scenario. You have students that you know really, really well, you know all their ins and outs, and then I give you two lines and you're supposed to figure something out for these imaginary students. You know, that's much more difficult. But thank you so much for the, the work that you did on this. I, I love these, I've been reading through them. Um, so I'll just review them really quickly. Scenario one, um, Jody is a student that wants to be a chef. She has a fluency disorder. So the goals and activities were practice typical phrases related to kitchen, vocabulary, scripted lines, strategies. Here's a big one, work to advocate for self and notify employer school fluency disorder, role play activities, social scenes, problem scenarios. Those were all fantastic. And I did see the theme of self-advocacy throughout this, which is wonderful. That's going to be um, probably one of the most important life skills that any of your students will ever have is the ability to advocate for themselves. Because when we are no longer there with them, they ultimately need to rely on themselves with of course their family for support, but, but definitely themselves. Okay. So scenario two, Valerie wants to major in science. She's working on articulation and, and it seems to be affecting her socially. So opportunities to practice vocabulary, containing targeted sounds, advocating for herself. Again, this was a theme, role-playing. I saw role-playing a lot of places as well. And the beauty of role-playing, kind of like social stories, right, is that we can take any situation and we can create a role-play out of it and allow the student to play that part, um, either the part of themselves or even of the other person that they would be communicating with. It's so flexible and can be used with uh, so many different environments. Um, I believe I skipped one. Uh, and th this group had a lot of good activities. So this student, we might see more than um, often than not, she doesn't really know what she wants to do, <laughs> but she thinks maybe it might involve construction because um, she loves hands-on stuff and she's got some expressive and receptive language. Uh, difficulties. So I love that you guys put here use of a diagram because if you remember from our video working in construction, there's a lot of visual communication there. Like there's a lot of communication through measurements, through numbers, through diagrams, through drawings. And so directly working on that sort of task uh, could be great for this student. And then, you know, uh, I love that. Uh, you also had to give her a system, not just one thing, but a system to get support from a manager or supervisor, and that you're looking into the different environments that she could work in. Very nice. I'll just look through a couple more of them, um, but I'm just so excited about all the work that you did here. So Jose wants to major in video game design. Okay, out of curiosity, how many of you have students that want to major in video game or side? Seriously, raise your hand because I have two and I only have like six students, you know. So 33% of my students want to major in video game design. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's see about Jose. Jose uses an AAC system. He um, is in a wheelchair, has cerebral palsy. He uses switches to complete his coding projects, but he has been asked to join a team of designers working on a new RPG, which is what? Role-playing game for those of you who don't have students that want to major in video game design. <laughs> now you know. Um, so making sure that he has all the terminology he needs or a way to express it. So um, a way to get his point across to other people, self-advocacy skills, again, are gonna be really important. Making sure he's able to request help in the job setting determine an effective group communication app that works 
in tandem with his AAC system. So, so that's a, a good thing to think about. Uh, how is his group? He's on a team. How are they communicating? So are they communicating via a digital platform? Probably. So how would he use Zoom? how would he use his AAC system in conjunction with something like Zoom? Or maybe Google Hangouts, depending on what they're using. How are they getting together? Um, in gaming, there is a social media uh, platform that a lot of people use, and that's called Discord. Do you guys know Discord? Okay, I see some nods and smiles. If you have teenage students, you should know about Discord because a lot of the kids are on it, and a lot of them use it to talk about gaming. Right, so this student, because they want, he wants a career in video game design, it would probably be a great idea if he was able to use Discord because he could go on those platforms to get ideas. All right, Greg, Greg wants to be a teacher. He's enrolled in university. Um, he is diagnosed as a clutterer. So he works on managing rate of speech, interactions with listeners, clarity. Um, so you guys here came up with some really great specific activities, create a list of speaking tasks he thinks will encounter as a teacher, um, you know, participate in different role plays. Again, role plays are always great. Approaching professors, mock interviews, giving a lesson to class, et cetera. Um, really great. And I love, again, that self-advocacy is playing a role in all of these. That's wonderful. And then we had Gretchen. She's not totally sure what she wants to do, but she wants to advocate. She wants to fight for the rights of people with disabilities and is working on expressive language. So we had here, she's going to research locations, organizations that advocate, um, call those organizations with questions. I love that one. Um, and she could also do things like email as well, I suppose, and have a mock interview when she decides which organization she might want to join. Dina is studying childcare and she wants to start working at a daycare. So we have use of visual schedule to follow directions for tasks. She's working on receptive language skills and communication with or interacting with communication partners. So use of checklists, note-taking app, graphic organizer. Um, yeah, so she might need to do that for school and maybe she would need to take notes in the daycare setting as well, I suppose, if she's like talking to her management about what she needs to do. Um, role play scenarios that she might come in contact with on the job, self-monitor her interactions, great. And just a couple more, we have Aiden who wants to major in cybersecurity. Um, this is my oldest son, except that he does not have an articulation disorder. He just doesn't like to talk to people. He's in that teenage phase of let's not interact with anyone <laughs> at all, but he does want to major in cybersecurity. So I love these pair articulation tasks with cybersecurity vocab, work on perspective taking, role play scenarios that might come up. Because what students who major in cybersecurity do not think of is that in addition to making um, different websites or, or uh, platforms safe for people, they also have to tell people why they need to be safe with <laughs> cyber um, information and why they need to keep their information safe. So there is actually a lot of customer service that happens. And for many of our students, when they go into a, a job, and I'm sure I was like this too, you like certain aspects of the job, but you don't always think of all of them. You know, what are all the responsibilities you have? Um, like a dental hygienist can't only just like to clean teeth, they also have to have that ability to small talk, ask how you are, you know, how are your children doing? Oh, what's the weather like? As, you know, um, they need that social aspect as well. And same too with cybersecurity, even though you wouldn't think of it. Okay, Thomas would like to be a police officer, has great people skills, but challenged by written expression. Um, so he's going to maybe use speech to text. He's going to do different activities with video clips and pictures to describe, um, identify fact versus opinion in descriptions. That is fantastic. What a great idea. And then advocate and role play asking for permission to record an interview. Great. Those were really fantastic and very suited to that job. And last one, Mikey has a wish to be a vet tech wants to work at a rescue shelter. He's shy, he's been working on social language. So we have practice interacting with a variety of different people, make a list of acceptable topics of conversation told with customers at the vet practice. I like that one. 
list of questions that he can ask about the pet, not only to gain information, but to keep his customer at ease. So wonderful, wonderful ideas, everyone. I love it. I'm gonna stop the share. We are almost done here. Wanna make sure I get you out right on time. Okay, so, whoop. You should see the PowerPoint slideshow coming on back. Are you able to see that? Okay, yes, thank you. I appreciate you putting a note in the chat. I'm actually seeing it on another screen, so that's why I'm looking around. All right, so I wanted to thank you guys for attending this May section, the May session of our uh, secondary transition and SLP series that we had throughout this year. This was post-secondary education career and the world at large. Um, but do remember that we did three other courses this year. If you or any of your colleagues want to access these courses, you can do so on Schoology. So please feel free to view those videos um, and you know, look at the resources that are on the sites for these because we would like this information to keep growing. If you would like to receive credit for these, but you maybe you only took one or two this year, we're probably gonna offer them next year as well. So you can participate then, all right. Do you have any comments or questions you'd like to share in the chat before I give you the all important code? The code, it's all about the code. And I'll give you a second to type. Um, and do remember, you can always reach out to us. My name is Jennifer Geibel. We also have Elizabeth Christopher in the central office, Tammy Thompson Cook and Liz Serpentine in the east. And Liz was my right hand man today, helping me move people in and out of breakout rooms and such. And, so thank you, Liz, for being on. All right, I'm gonna take a look and see if we have any questions. All right, I'm glad that you guys enjoyed the sessions. Oh, okay, so we do have a question. Um, so I talked about in the video that when a student moves on to post-secondary education, in order to get accommodations, the student must self-disclose and request accommodations. And she said, in reality, how often does this happen? Or is it parent directed often? Well, I think from what I said in the video, when I researched this, there's a large portion of students that probably could request accommodations that do not. It could be up to 67% of students do not <laughs> request accommodations. Um, so the, a student doesn't have to do this. But if they want accommodations, they have to self-disclose. So not all students will self-disclose, but if they want those accommodations, they really need to. And so the other part of the question was, is this parent directed? It really can't be at college. College is student directed. So you should not have a parent necessarily walking into the Office of Disability Resources and saying, I want this for my student, because quite frankly, they are not the person that's getting the accommodations. It should be student directed. So these are conversations to have with your families. All right, um, Ashley, I can send you the code since you have to go see your kids. <laughs> okay, we had somebody ask for the code. All right, so the link to this, the Zoom, or I'm sorry, the link to the Google form for Asha is on your Schoology account. And your code is pretty easy. It is world five, two, three. Oh, and we do have somebody who wrote as a former university faculty, we cannot talk to parents without specific permission due to FERPA. Yeah, so again, we can't have this process be parent directed. It really has to be student directed. All right, so world five, two, three, that's world and today's date. So you can go to Schoology and access the link and it will be open now. It opens at four o'clock, all right? So I'm going to stop recording and I'm gonna hang on. Thanks all of you for attending. I hope you have a great afternoon.